Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the first installment of Woodrow Wilson Then and Now. Consistent with its mission as a national memorial to the 28th US president, Woodrow Wilson, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars uh, and particularly its history and public policy program is launching Woodrow Wilson Then and Now, a new series of scholarly conversations exploring the significant and complicated legacies of the man and his presidency for our own day. My name is Trigvi Frontfeit, Global Fellow for History and Public Policy at the Wilson Center. I also serve as Director of Strategic Partnership for the Minnesota Humanities Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. We hope this series will be a platform for an inclusive as well as critical discussion of Wilson's biography, his White House tenure, and his long-term impact on US foreign and domestic politics. And we're very pleased to have as our launching partner, Professor Jack Hamilton to discuss his latest book, Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda. John Maxwell Hamilton is the Hopkins Brazil professor in LSU's, excuse me, Louisiana State University's Manship School of Mass Communication and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in DC. Uh, Hamilton had a long and very distinguished career as a reporter, uh, both at home and abroad, uh, as well as in uh, government, uh, where for a time he oversaw nuclear non-proliferation issues for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and also served in the, in the State Department during the Carter administration. Um, at LSU, uh, Jack was founding dean of the Manship School and executive vice chancellor and provost. Uh, he received the Freedom Forum's Administrator of the Year Award in 2003 for his work at the Manship School. Jack is author or co-author of seven books, uh, including Journalism's Roving Eye, A History of American News Gathering Abroad, which won the Goldsmith Prize and is a definitive work on history of American foreign reporting. Most recently, Jack is author of Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda, from Louisiana State University Press just out this year. Uh, Manipulating the Masses explores the great war origins of one of the most profound and enduring threats to American democracy, the systematic production and dissemination of propaganda to advance administration aims. Through its Committee on Public Information, the United States government exercised unprecedented power to shape the views and attitudes of citizens. Nothing like it had existed before and it would be dismantled at the end of the war, but not, I suspect, Jack will tell us, without leaving some important legacies for our own day. So again, thank you all for being here and thanks especially to Jack for joining us and helping us launch this series. Thank you very much for having me, Trig. appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, Jack, uh, let me just start by asking you to tell the audience about your book. Um, what is the specific story you're telling? I'm sure you can tell it much better than I did in those um, brief lines. Um, what's your main argument and what is the new light that you shed on the World War I era, uh, World War I era American politics and its legacies? And what lessons do you want Americans today to learn? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, a good place to start. Let, let me say, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Wilson Center for having had me first as a resident fellow and now as a global scholar. It's been enormously helpful to me. The staff there has assisted me in many ways, particularly the library. And I especially want to thank Mike Van Dusen, uh, who's become a good friend and is the reason I was invited to be there in the first place. And I appreciate that very much. Uh, the Wilson Center does a lot of very good, important work, and it's uh, really wonderful to be associated with them. Uh, there's more than one theme in the book, but the main theme is that ground zero for government propaganda, that is the beginning of systematic pervasive propaganda, begins with the Committee on Public Information, which was headed by George Creel. Uh, to understand why it may be relevant, we might remember that Donald Trump has been called the greatest propagandist in uh, whoever occupied the White House. But interestingly, the same thing was said about Woodrow Wilson, that he was the greatest propagandist in the modern world, uh, uh, displaying extraordinary skill and dexterity. So two men from two different parties uh, have had this so-called accolade uh, given to them. 
And I think it tells us something because what everything that happened with the Committee on Public Information uh, can be seen manifested one way or another in what we see today, including even social media, which I can get into uh, in a minute. But I think maybe the place to start having said that is with first of all, just what the CPI did give a sense of the range of its activities. It existed only 18 months, but during that time, it uh, demonstrated phenomenal creativity and uh, enterprise. And as you look back, as I look back, and as I began to learn about the CPI, I was constantly stunned by just everything they managed to do in that short period of time without having any template, nothing to go by, other than the fact that they could follow what uh, other countries did, which is something I'll say something about in a minute. So press releases had existed before the Committee on Public Information existed, uh, but the CPI made press releases a Quotidian part of American government. What had been a trickle under Woodrow Wilson, under uh, Teddy Roosevelt, became uh, a Niagara Falls of not only press releases and handouts, but magazine articles, syndicate, uh, syndicated features, which were sent out by the CPI pamphlets, many of them tailored to special audiences. Uh, and there was no uh, form of communication that they did not use. In fact, George Creel, the head of the CPI, as I said, uh, was quite proud of that. And it was one of the few cases where he said something that wasn't uh, an overstatement. Uh, they had a cartoon service. They enlisted advertising executives who mobilized ads for free all over the country. They used uh, movies and uh, had tremendous influence not only over what movies were shown, but the movies that uh, they were able to produce themselves. They enlisted university professors on a scale that's really quite extraordinary. Um, their, um, their reach was um, exceptional. The, the engineer for that was a man named uh, Guy Stanton Ford, who was at the University of Minnesota, where you've been, Trig, and uh, went on to be the president of the university, I might add. Uh, they found ways to enlist every kind of person they could think of, from corporate tycoons who gave them uh, money and assistance to the Boy Scouts who helped them carry uh, pamphlets and distribute them nationally. They even used uh, traveling salesmen. Uh, they founded the first US government uh, information service overseas. Uh, it's the predecessor of VOA and Radio Free Europe and all the rest. And they pioneered the concept of public diplomacy, uh, which was, I might add, quite an uh, achievement. And I might just focus on one, one aspect here very quickly because it does show the, the, um, how light they were on their feet. From the very, in the very first days, George Creel was holed up in a small library, a little jewel box of a library in the old executive office, what is now the old executive office building. And a, a young man showed up from Chicago, a member of a rich group of people who had been putting on uh, speeches during the breaks in movie theaters when they changed the reels in Chicago. These speeches had been used to uh, get the United States government and get public support for um, preparing for war if it should occur. And now this young guy came to see Creel and said, what if we do that in movies across the country uh, to support the war? By the end of the war, there were 75,000 so-called four minute men, four minute being the time that they, they were got up to speak. They were almost all in movies, but not all, some were in logging camps and churches uh, Indian reservations, uh, they were all over the country. But 75,000 is an extraordinary number. And what's it, what makes it even more interesting and tells you a lot about the CPI is that they appeared to be local, local journalists, local lawyers, local political leaders, doctors. But in fact, they were very carefully orchestrated by Washington. It was a tour de force actually. And they had a message every week, they were given canned speeches, but if they didn't use canned speeches, they were expected to follow uh, a very clear script on what they were supposed to say. Uh, sometimes they were asking people to buy bonds and sometimes they were asking people to look out for spies. Sometimes it was something as simple as donate your binoculars to the Navy because the Navy has shortages. And by the way, they got tens of thousands of binoculars when they did this. Uh, so that's the range of what the CPI did. Uh, it also was involved in the suppression of information. Uh, the CPI was created in the first place to actually be a censoring body, uh, but that and there was a very strong censorship law that Wilson wanted passed, which was very much like the uh, Defense of the Realm Act in Great Britain. That did not occur. Uh, even members of the Democratic Party, and of course the Democrats controlled Congress in those days, couldn't stomach the idea. And Wilson was refused to budge uh, in 
toning it down a little bit. And if he had, actually, it would have changed, I think, the way uh, Supreme Court law would have uh, had to deal with um, impingement of freedom of speech later on. But anyway, they did pass the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act and the Trading with the Enemy Act. And although the CPI didn't have real censorship powers uh, written in law, they did de facto have powers that were used in a number of ways to um, officially uh, control speech. But they also had the power of just having power and that gave them the ability to intimidate and coerce. Today, we use the word spinning. Uh, in those days, the word truly was creeling. Uh, people were being creeled when George Creel got on the phone or sent them a letter and told them to shut up. Uh, by the way, the word fake news is not new, even though Donald Trump claims it is. There was actually a book in 1912 called Fake News. Uh, and the term was also used and it was also applied to the CPI. Uh, I'm gonna very quickly, I don't wanna just go down a long list, but I wanna quickly say a couple of things about what else the CPI did or is attached to that makes this book, I think, um, have something to offer. One is that it thought of itself as a thoroughly American proposition, but it wasn't. Uh, it advertised itself as such, but in fact, it, it did pretty much what all belligerents did in general. It has its own specific way of handling issues, including what the Germans did. There's an iron law of propaganda, or so I call it, which is only the enemy does propaganda. And interestingly, when the Committee on Public Information put out a encyclopedia for the war, they had one entry for, psych for propaganda, and it was propaganda, German. There was no such thing as American propaganda or British propaganda. Uh, another aspect uh, that came to the fore in this book that I had not predicted at all was that the, the test kitchen for the CPI was a 1916 presidential campaign. Uh, they had an extraordinarily successful, well-disciplined publicity bureau in that campaign. Uh, I think you can look at that as one of the one of the key stepping stones in political campaigns, but it also became, as I say, the test kitchen for the CPI because many people, including George Creel, worked on that bureau and used the bureau's techniques. And what we have seen since as propaganda has become a normal part of government, uh, there's a kind of dialectic that exists. When Barack Obama gets elected, he uses social media and as soon as he's in office, he creates an office of social strategy, which uses social media. Uh, a couple of other things and I'll go through very quickly. Uh, it had a very shaky foundation and that's never really been discussed. I believe that the CPI actually was unconstitutional in the way it was constituted. I can go into that if somebody wants to do it. No one's ever really talked about the wars it had with Congress and how at the end it was brought somewhat under control by Congress. Although in the beginning, Congress didn't appropriate any money for it, didn't authorize its creation uh, and didn't um, review Creel for the job. In other words, there was no advice and consent on that appointment. Uh, no one's ever talked about the CPI's failure to do over the trenches propaganda, which was a disaster. No one's ever talked in depth about the way it used fronts organizations, which incidentally it claimed over and over again it never did. Very little is said about its involvement with white Russian disinformation. Uh, the fact that there was white Russian disinformation and that it was bogus has been explored, but what I was able to show is the extent to which the CPI because they welcomed this disinformation, they wanted it to be true, actually rammed it down the throat of the American public and the press. There was virtually no dissent when the CPI put this information out and they used all the power of their office to try to make it stick. Uh, no one's really discussed how they um, continued their work after the war uh, and tried to hang on for a little while when the war was over, including a bizarre mission to Eastern Europe, which is worthy of the Keystone Cops and no one has ever really zeroed in on the extent to which the press was complicit. They, they took umbrage of a lot of what the CPI did, but they actually were extraordinarily supportive of the Wilson administration. And to give you one quick example of that, when the CPI, uh, when the second year of the Pulitzer Prize, Prizes were given out, there was a prize that was given out for a monograph on journalism. It was the only time such a prize was ever given. And it was given to two young people who wrote a monograph arguing that the press had done a good job because they suppressed information and did what the administration wanted done, which is an extraordinary uh, um, argument considering its Pulitzer Prizes are meant for journalism and independence. But that was the tenor of the times. Trig, are you with us? Thank you. Yes, I am now with you. Uh, 
I just want to let the audience member know before I go on to our next question that there will be time for audience questions in the last um, half or so of this program, and we'll be requesting those via the chat function. Um, Jack, your last point is fascinating uh, because as you mentioned in the book, um, uh, many Americans, including many in the press and many, many people who both considered themselves and even have survived um, the, uh, uh, the harsher lenses of historians uh, with the uh, label progressive intact. Um, uh, many Americans who were devoted to strengthening democracy saw government's role as one of both informing and educating the public, which is to say persuading the public, uh, especially in a time of war uh, and in a time when um, while historians and political scientists have kind of gone back and forth in waves as to whether or not they agreed with this, uh, many Americans who were very clear headed, um, both in the general populace and um, among officialdom, really did see uh, Germany's aggression in Europe as a threat to world peace and to American national security. So should elected governments not aggressively promote the policies that they think are critical for national security, uh, for national growth and for health? Um, what if the policy is say masking up or getting vaccinated or reducing pollution? Um, in short, what, what is the line between leadership and propaganda and what specifically made the CPI um, cross that line in your view? Uh, whether in terms of its constitutionality or in terms of its democratic ethics. So uh, information is like the plant deadly nightshade. You can make potions out of it that actually induce sanity and you can make potions out of it that addle your brain. And that's the problem with government information to get the, the mixture correct. You can't have a democracy without government transparency. Government needs to tell you what the weather's gonna be, what trade statistics are. It needs to tell you when hurricanes are coming. Uh, it needs to tell you whether how they're letting contracts for uh, government contractors. Uh, all of those things are absolutely essential. And then in addition to that, uh, elected leaders need to make the case for the policies they wanna proceed, pursue. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have a real democracy. But there is a possibility of taking government's money and our taxpayers' money and using it to shape their views uh, in ways that are not democratic. How we draw the line is very difficult. And I can, I've spent a lot of time on this when I started writing the book. I spent a lot of time learning what's going on today. Uh, but we know governments today do things like fake videos. Uh, pretty much every administration in recent years has done such a thing as that. Uh, we know that governments um, use taxpayer dollars and have the agencies themselves try to, for example, lobby Congress. The Obama administration did that with the Affordable Care Act and uh, try to load up the agenda, for example, on clean water. You might like clean water, you might not. You might like the Affordable Care Act, but should you use, really use taxpayer dollars to lobby Congress? Uh, and so the, the list for these goes on. And of course, we've seen with Donald Trump how far the boundaries can be pushed. He's just now started a $300 million campaign uh, to make Americans feel good about themselves in the coronavirus moment, which is clearly meant also to make people feel good about him. He's put his name on coronavirus checks and on food aid and, and a letter in boxes of food aid going out to people who are poor and need food. He uses the White House as a prop in the presidential, uh, in the Republican National Convention. So how do we draw the line? It's very difficult. We have some laws. They're rarely, they're, they're, rare, they're not very good. We don't even define the difference between propaganda and publicity. And furthermore, uh, the people who have to enforce the laws of the Justice Department who, guess what, work for the White House. So um, it's a problem that really needs to be solved and needs to be addressed because the, the government's, the size of the government information, information apparatus has grown bigger and bigger and the size of legitimate serious journalists, the number of journalists in Washington has actually decreased as a result of disruption in the news business. And I think much more needs to be done on this subject. We can talk about it and I've just done a piece on it for Politico, but um, that's what I would say. One other point though, Trig, I wanna make is it was true that during the war, the government uh, journalists were very supportive 
But when the war ended, journalists became felt as if they had been used. Uh, and they felt a lot of the things they had been used for had not been worthy causes because they thought Wilson hadn't followed through. Some of his staunchest supporters who had been journalists started writing about how they were forced to goose step in the war rather than be independent. Many historians look at the Vietnam War as the beginning of journalism cynicism about government, but I think it's pretty clear the cynicism begins at the end of World War I. Thank you, Jack. Um, you mentioned uh, Wilson uh, by name at the end of your answer there, and I'd, I'd like to ask you about your title, uh, Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda. Wilson is, in fact, uh, on my reading, a pretty, a pretty minor character in the book. Um, Creel is the main player, uh, and some of your characterizations of Wilson would be disputed by recent historians who have dug deeply into the record of his thoughts and actions. Um, that he had no time for the give and take of ideas, that he was deluded in thinking the Senate and public would support the League. Um, in fact, the majority of senators did, and recent research suggests an even greater share of the public did too. Um, some of these characterizations uh, support the, um, the idea that journalists became cynical about Wilson because um, he wasn't able to follow through, as you said. Um, I think there are other historians who would read the battle, uh, the League fight, the battle for a ratification of the Treaty of Versailles in a, in a slightly more uh, complicated light that is a, a little bit more forgiving of Wilson. Um, my question is whether you agree with those particular points or not. Do you think it was Wilson's intention to manipulate the masses? Um, or are you making a subtler argument about uh, particularly egregious sins of omission on his part or his distraction from the home front given the pressures uh, of the war? Uh, can Wilson really be considered the father of American propaganda as the title implies? Yeah, so um, actually, I, several ways you're characterizing what, I write, what I've written in the book don't strike me as, um, reminds me of what Socrates allegedly said when he was defending himself. He said, I listened to everything you said and I found myself convinced until I realized you were talking about me. Uh, I think, I think, that, I think, I think that's appropriate. I think Wilson is, has rolled around in his grave several times over the past hundred years feeling the same way. Yeah. Uh, Wilson's not a minor figure in this book. He's a major figure in this book. The only name that would, I mean, I didn't do a name count, but the only name that would appear more often is George Creel's name for the obvious reason, but there wouldn't have been a CPI without Wilson. And uh, Creel was very close to Wilson, so close to Wilson that he was considered one of the most important people in Washington and one of the most influential. Uh, he met with Wilson all the time, not every day, but many people, he, he was considered so important, many people thought he did meet almost every day. He was close to Wilson in the sense that Wilson liked talking to him because, Will, because, because Creel knew how to make Wilson laugh at the end of a long day. The CPI was a joint creation of Wilson and Creel. There's no question about that. Now, if you decide that I'm wrong, that systematic government propaganda doesn't begin in World War I, then I guess the book shouldn't be called Woodrow Wilson and Manipulating the Masses. But I, I believe it does, and I think I make the case. And uh, I think that Wilson is apparent throughout. Wilson often told Creel he couldn't do certain things. There were things he told Wilson, uh, he told Creel he wanted him to do, like create the, uh, the official bulletin, a national newspaper, which was something that Wilson had been thinking about for a long, long time, even before he was president. Uh, and so there were times he wouldn't do what Creel wanted. And there were times he did uh, do what Creel wanted, but he was very much involved. He once said to uh, Secretary of State Lansing that he wanted Lansing to butt out of a particular issue uh, on uh, dealing with propaganda because I can I consider uh, I'm very jealous about propaganda and I consider it my responsibility to pay attention to it. And uh, that was how Lansing was told to behave. Um, now, with regard to the, whether Wilson had no time for ideas, I don't think I say that at all. I think I make the case that he was a, an active public intellectual well before he was president. Uh, he obviously developed fields like public administration uh, and he wrote extensively on government and wrote about it, although he, was, he, he wrote about it without doing a lot of individual in-depth research, but he wrote about it theoretically, but in a practical 
as you would say in your book, which you asked me to read and, and which I have, and, it, and a, he was pragmatic. Um, he gave a lot of thought to the issues of publicity and those issues of publicity that he thought about, which he called pitiless, pitiless publicity and talked about all the time, were ideas that he employed when he did take over the CPI. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, he was a progressive, as you say, and like progressives, he thought that the CPI, uh, he thought it was important to illuminate issues because then the public would arrive at the right conclusion if they knew the facts. Uh, the problem with for progressives was, and for Wilson, I might add, was that there's a flaw in that thinking because what happened is muckrakers who had been interested in shedding light um, on problems ended up becoming government officials. And so they ended up creating an information trust. So now instead of being trust busters, they were in charge of a trust. And that has an inherent problem attached to it. There's also a naivete to think that if the public just gets the fact the facts in front of them, they'll come to the right conclusion. It's not quite that simple. Uh, uh, as far as his 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 not have exchanging ideas, yes, he exchanges ideas with people, but he also had um, he he could be a he could be a loner, and he didn't like people around him who disagreed, and he didn't like the give and take with journalists. Somebody like Teddy Roosevelt instinctively wanted to deal with journalists, and was uh, you know did a lot in the area of publicity before Wilson came along. He did it instinctively. Wilson didn't like interacting with journalists except for a small number that he thought were, uh, were friendly to him. And there's a wonderful quote, I have it here in my book, from uh, uh, Ray Standard Baker, one of my great heroes, a terrific journalist who went to work for uh, Wilson. And I argue in the book, became the first, qualifies as the first presidential press secretary, if you define that as somebody who works full-time for the president as an interlocutor between the president and the press. And here's what he said. It's an odd thing that while the president stands for pitiless publicity and open covenants openly arrived at, a true proposition if ever there was one, it is so difficult for him to practice it. He is really so afraid of it. And I think that's a very insightful comment uh, by, by Baker, actually. I think it gets at, um, at the problem. Uh, the muckrakers, and I think the story of the CPI is not a story of good people, uh, of bad people doing bad things. It's actually a story of good people doing some good things and some bad things. And the problem with propaganda is that it's uh, seductive. Once you, once you realize that you have all this power, you wanna use it to get the ends that you like. And I will quote something else from the book that I did not write, but that I quote. It's a wonderful line from Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he says, if you have no doubt of your premises or your powers and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. And uh, I think that in a, not just law, but in a broader sense, describes what happened with the muckrakers and the progressives that worked for the CPI. They began to take all kinds of shortcuts to get the conclusions they wanted the public to have rather than making it a truly democratic proposition. And I think I'll make one final point about Wilson. Wilson's views on publicity are, are as you point out, very complicated. And one part of it was, that the, the idea, and he, this is a very progressive statement, he wanted to get people to think the right things, to know the right things, I don't have the exact quote, to know the right things and, uh, and, and to follow them. And his goal really was that he wanted uh, the public, uh, the press particularly, and others to defer to him. And, and that, was, that was a problem. I do not say, it, and finally, I do not say anywhere in the book that there wasn't support for uh, the League of Nations, I don't say that. And I don't say that there wasn't support for it in Congress. What I say was that Wilson wasn't willing to compromise and that Wilson was too late in going out and doing what he should have done and what he actually, into, what he actually intellectually understood was important, which was to use propaganda for a salubrious end. Jack, we'll have to have a drink and I'll, I'll email you the page citations that raised my eyebrows um, and uh, we, can, we can chat about these at, at greater length. Um, I do have one final question before we get to the audience questions, however. Um, you make a, your concluding chapters make a, I think a, a complicated uh, and very interesting argument uh, and quite original argument, I think. Um, despite the abuses of the CPI or the perils of propaganda that you, that you chronicle, you suggest that Wilson, um, should have maintained the CPI after 1918 or maintained some sort of operation in order to win the peace um, through, through 
persuasion, uh, if not through propaganda. Um, how do you envision that counterfactual playing out in a way that would have been good for American and world politics? Um, uh, right. Well, yeah, let me let me just elaborate on the point. Right. So it would have been good if he could have kept something like the CPI around and parts of remnants of it did carry on a bit. But the problem was that the CPI had done so many things that upset people, including journalists and including, obviously, members of Congress, include even even Democrats to some extent. Uh, it just was politically not tenable to keep the CPI. They could, however, have kept elements of the CPI around, and some of them stood ready to really help. The Four Minute Men, for example, continued to do some work on their own after the after the CPI was dissolved, and, and they could have called on those remnants to help. There were, as you point out in your book, there are a lot of organizations out there who who expressed support for uh, for Wilson's ideas. There's no question about that. Uh, the League to Enforce Peace was the one that was the most aggressive and had the best uh, had, had the had the most energetic coordinated effort, but of course it didn't report to Wilson, it reported to um, former President Taft, and Taft was a Republican. And there were limits to how much Taft was gonna go along with Wilson. And furthermore, uh, Hayes, who was the head of the Democratic National Committee at that point, a Republican National Committee, managed to manipulate tr Taft to waffle a bit on the, on the treaty, which actually worked against selling it, but anyway, Wilson needed his own organization. And he had been told repeatedly by George Creel and a whole lot of other people that he needed to pay attention to mobilizing public support to get the, to get the treaty in. And members of Congress like Lodge who were opposed to the treaty in large part were very fearful of the fact that they thought Wilson could prevail if he really used, if he really used the tools that he would have had available. But the problem is he didn't. And when he got around to it, it was too late. And of course he fell ill in Pueblo and had to come back. And then he was really cut off from making his case publicly. What would have happened if we had, I, I think your question asked, what would have happened if we had, um, if we had gotten the League of Nations? Well, but, uh, go ahead. No, no, you gave a very good answer. I was more asking about um, what the, um, what the sort of education campaign uh, that you envisioned a more successful education campaign would have would have looked like. Uh, yeah, you, you needed one, as one, somebody once said, you needed one that had campaign slogans and songs. And, and although that may sound funny, uh, you needed, just as the CPI wages its, its uh, work, much like it was a political campaign, which was of course, to some extent tendentious, now they had an opportunity in a truly democratic milieu because the war was over to really make the case to try to persuade the public. And there was private money to support a separate organization. And there were some very qualified pe people to have that job. And one of them was Robert Woolley, who um, I admire enormously. He headed the Publicity Bureau during, uh, in 1916 in the Democratic National Committee. There, were, there was talent out there who could have really helped Wilson. And uh, would they have made a difference? I think still Wilson probably would have had to make some compromise, but it would have made his job a lot easier. Well, as you know, I think Wilson made a lot more compromises than he gets credit for, but I wanna to turn to, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you, Jack, for, um, for your very thoughtful answers. Um, and I wanna to turn to, uh, we have a lot of audience questions in the chat actually, and they've been coming in almost from minute 10. So um, I'm gonna to try to get through uh, as many as I can. One that just came in, but I think is going to be of interest uh, to a lot of Wilson Center folks um, uh, comes from uh, Ross Johnson. Uh, in the early Cold War, propaganda was not a negative word in the United States and did not imply spin, disinformation, dishonest journalism, or fake news. The 1956 Webster definition is not negative. It means concerted effort to spread information. Uh, what vocabulary did Wilson and CPI use? And if they use the word propaganda, what did they understand by that word? And I think also as a historian, Jack, when you go back and read Wilson's contemporaries talking about Wilson and propaganda, um, is there a danger uh, of, of smuggling in a, a contemporary um, aversion to that word and concept? Well, um... So occasionally Creel and people on the CPI staff, but very rarely use the word propaganda. 
It's quite right. Before the war, uh, the word propaganda was uh, a word that was associated largely with the Catholic Church. I, I've done some some work at how often, say, for example, the New York Times used the word propaganda. I've got quite a lot of data data on it. Uh, it was still relatively benign before you get to 1914 when the war started. Uh, but once the war started, propaganda becomes a starts to become a very odious word. And the CPI not only didn't use the word, but was explicit that it didn't do propaganda. We do not do propaganda. And by the we way, do public information, right? <laughs> uh, uh, well, we do publicity, which, you know, progressive journalists use the word publicity in a way that they would never use today. Journalists would never use today. Ray Standard Baker, who I, I said I, I, um, I really like, he, he would say things literally like, I'm going to go out and do publicity right now and show how the railroads are being run by corporations. So the word publicity was a more benign, uh, a benign word. Uh, and the word propaganda was considered um, a bad word. And you know, it's funny that this question was asked, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you. It's very easy. There was a, the, the British Encyclopedia had no definition for the word propaganda when it came out uh in uh 1911 which was the last edition before the war uh the only entry was somewhere in between they had something where they talked about the catholic church when they they felt they they thought as you as many of you probably know the encyclopedia came out uh sometimes it would be 20 or 30 years before a new edition came out but when the war was over they felt they had to have a new edition and so they did publish one in 1920 and that 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 one had a um a definition that ran 10 densely packed uh, pages of type written by a former British propagandist. And it's actually a brilliant piece of work. And it's worth reading what his, uh, what his definition, part of what his definition was because it's so, it's, it's, a, it's a very thoughtful definition. Those engaged in a propaganda may genuinely believe that success will be, the advantage to, will be an advantage to those whom they address. But the stimulus to their action is their own cause. The differentia of a propaganda is that it is self-seeking, whether the object be worthy or unworthy, intrinsically or in the minds of its promoters. Uh, and so the word propaganda had started to become a negative, a very negative word. Um, at the end of the war, uh, the word publicity began to be something that was separated from news. There were publicists and there were people who did, uh, who, who did journalism. And of course, then one of the members of the CPI staff, uh, Edward Bernays, the famous pioneer of public relations, coined the phrase public relations council, which is where that word took shape. That's a, that's a perfect segue actually into two additional questions. Um, thank you for that, Jack. Uh, 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 Christian Osterman, uh, head of our history and public policy program, um, wants to know if you could uh, give us just a little bit more background on Creel and his role. How did he come to developing his approach to information policy, publicity, propaganda? And then um, let me see if I can find, there was another um, guest who, ah, and then Rui Santos asks, um, uh, uh, do you consider Bernays an important figure in this history? Um, uh, so, so first of all, Bernays is a small player. Um, he had a role. He was his typical uh, creative self, but he wasn't a major player in the organization. He didn't have a large administrative role. He was a staff member, um, although he claimed that a lot of what he learned in public relations, he learned at the CPI, as did Carl Beyer, who had a, a very important role, who was also considered one of the fathers of uh, public relations. In the, now, in, the post, in the post in the post World War II era, these yes, days. Carl Beyer was right. uh, he, Beyer and um, and um, Bernays are two of the major major figures in the development of public relations as a profession. There are probably maybe two others, but those are the main those are the main ones. Ivy Lee is another one. Uh, now Creel, Creel, <laughs> I could talk about Creel uh, <laughs> for four hours. But, but let me try to and still not run out of things to say about him because he was such a wildly colorful character. Uh, but let me start out by saying this. He was a terrible choice for this job. <laughs> and it was it was a huge mistake to have put him in it. And uh, and the reason for that was he he just he didn't he only knew how to do travel at one speed, which was high speed, and he exercised bad judgment. 
he was loved by his friends because he was funny and he could be self-deprecating, but he was wildly truculent and, and just never seemed to know when to put on the brakes. And this caused a lot of problems for the CPI and eventually led to the Congress investigating the CPI because he once gave a speech in May of 1918 in which uh, a number of people came to hear him in New York in which somebody asked him uh, if he thought that members of Congress um, had loyalty in their hearts, which was an Elihu Root statement about only people who had, uh, was a Republican had, uh, only people should get reelected who had loyalty in their hearts. And Creel, who could have just let it go, said he had no idea if members of Congress had loyalty in their heart, hearts because he never went slumming. <laughs> and the result of that was uh, just, he almost got fired. I mean, it was, and this story has never been told. And there were, there were three days of hearings and he got through it because many people in Congress didn't actually know what the CPI was doing. And they finally had somebody explain it to him. And Wilson stuck up for him and uh, really was, he was Creel's shield. The problem with Creel was, the, the problem with Creel for a historian, which might be worth mentioning here, is I've never had this problem in writing a book. You have major characters and of course you have to think about who they are and what their own agenda might be. But almost anything that Creel would say, you have to wonder if it's true. I, I'll give you one quick example. He makes a point at one, at, at one, in one spot of his, in, on his writing about the CPI that we never dealt with, with issues having to do with African-Americans. And in fact, that's a case where he was actually pretty progressive. He did some very constructive things and tried to get Wilson, as a matter of fact, to meet with editors and publishers who were black, which Wilson wouldn't do. Uh, but also, only one black was accredited to the American Expeditionary Force, and, and Creel made that happen. And yet, why would he say that? You can guess. He just had this capacity to, to say wild, unsus unsustainably, uh, unsupported things. And, uh, and so he, he is always saying that we don't have front organizations, we don't subsidize, we don't do this, I'm not a censor. But he did all of those things. And so that makes actually makes the, made the book something of a challenge to write, and I had to turn it around and show that this was, um, this was propaganda about propaganda. He, he was, however, uh, uh, he, he came from a progressive muckraking journalistic background. Okay, so muckrakers cover a huge swath of people. There were muckrakers like Ray Standard Baker or Lincoln Steffens who were mm -hmm. very thoughtful people and uh, who, who, who actually were deep thinkers. Creel was not a deep thinker. Creel was a barroom fighter. And, uh, and so he operated in a way that was often um, um, oversimplified. And he was far, and he, and, he, and he went too far in things he said. He just, he had a, he had a way to write, a way of writing that was ex extra extraordinary. I mean, some of the things he would say would be just, you, he was a very good writer, but they were wild. And um, they sound like things you see on, on the internet today when people are talking about Biden or Trump, you know, some website, just crazy stuff. And um, so there are a lot of different kinds of muckrakers. He was, not a muck, he was not a muckraker that goes down in the, the annals as one of the great muckrakers. He was not an investigative journalist. Yeah, I mean, he did some, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to fall into the trap of like Creel and saying things and making broad statements that aren't true, but that would be the, that would be the, that'd be generally the case. And when he was point, uh, picked newspapers for the job, people like the New York Times said, we can't imagine by any, why anybody with a pedigree like his would be in charge of an organization like this. We have another question about another uh, complicated uh, personality, uh, famous um, journalist with a very complicated relationship with uh, Woodrow Wilson and the Wilson administration from Anton Fedyashin. Please speak about the relationship between Walter Littman um, and especially, especially his deep disillusion in the years after the war uh, uh, embodied in his book, Public Opinion in 1922 um, and the CPI. So this, this relationship, um, as I got into it, became fascinating to me. There's a part of the Lippmann story that I've never seen told before. Um, Lippmann did go and work overseas with the a, a small group with the AEF uh, when, after he left the inquiry to try to do over the trenches propaganda. Uh, eventually, 
Creel wanted to be in charge of it. There was a lot of fighting. And in the end, as almost always happened, Wilson said Creel should be in charge, which really upset Lippman because the two of them had been at loggerheads for a long time. There was real animosity between the two men. In the end, then Creel failed, Creel and the CPI really failed to do anything. And the AEF took it over from there in the last, really just the last few days and did a pretty credible job. But what's, what's interesting about the Lippman story that I haven't ever seen is that Lippman had a, an enormous interest in being in charge of propaganda. He wanted Creel's job. He wanted it desperately. And this is pretty interesting because whoever asked that question, I don't remember who it was. Um, in fact, public opinion, if you read public opinion, you don't think he would have wanted that job. Incidentally, he doesn't say much in public opinion about his own role with the AEF. In fact, I believe he says nothing. Uh, and, um, and the reason was he was a progressive and he had an idea how this could be, he thought could be done. He started out pretty much from the same place Creel did because Creel said it shouldn't be about suppression, although he did that. He said it should be more about providing honest information, but of course he got carried away. Uh, anyway, Wilson didn't get the job. The reason he didn't get the job was he, first of all, um, Creel had a, a, a decent relationship with, with Wilson at that point, so did, so did Lippmann. But he had a very strong relationship with um, Josephus Daniels, who was a secretary of the Navy and a former journalist, and somebody that Creel had, during the campaign, had written a, a very a major piece about defending Daniels, who was often being criticized for his policies as the secretary of the Navy. So he had a bond with, with Daniels, and Daniels had an urgent need to have censorship because wireless was controlled by the Navy. And so, and it was all wireless was taken over by the Navy in World War I. And so therefore the censorship of, the, of, of uh, transatlantic communications fell to the Navy. So Creel went through Daniels. Daniels needed this done immediately. And so he made the case with Wilson and Wilson already had, as I say, a relationship with, with Creel. And so that's how Creel got the job. There was no template, by the way. There was, there was not even template. There was no it was a very vague order that created it. It was pretty open. It was very open-ended. Uh, Lippmann's uh, mentor was House, but House didn't have the same level of urgency. And he was also, as it was typical of House, he had all kinds of other people he was trying to put up to do propaganda too. He was actually pretty active in propaganda, even as the war went on. So Lippmann goes from there to um, trying to trying to get it when he gets it when he goes to work for Newton Baker. He asked Newton Baker if he could handle propaganda for him. He goes to Hoover and says he'd like to handle propaganda with him. Uh, he was constantly on this theme of wanting to do it. Uh, and I think that shows at the end of the war, he's only one example, mind you. And of course, of all the journalists, one of the most, obviously one of the most thoughtful and deep, deep thinkers of the whole group uh, of the disillusionment. There's a wonderful example of how disillusioned people became. Lippmann thought that being, being, and being involved in propaganda would be a very good thing. And in the end, he, uh, he decided he had serious doubts about it. And I might add, he wrote some very biting and entertaining comments about Creel when it was all over. Mm -hmm. I, if we had time, I'd quote you some of them. He, he, descri he describes Creel's um, uh, book about the CPI as being like going to a high school reunion and people telling you about the people, <laughs> the things they had done in school. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It's actually more witty than that, but you get the point. That's still pretty funny. Um, and I can see, I can almost imagine reading that from Lippmann's pen. Um, I, I missed a question earlier on that's kind of more of a <laughs> question. Um, and it's about the relationship between um, uh, the uh, US operations in the theater of war, um, the uh, white Russian um, versus uh, Bolshevik conflict. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on um, the type of white Russian propaganda um, that the CPI was pushing? Right. And <laughs> then there's a question about how that relates later to the Red Scare uh, in the United States. Right. So this, you know, one thing I learned in writing this is that I have a whole chapter devoted to the so-called Sisson papers, which is what this particular case is about. And I have to say, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever written because it's very hard to write about disinformation since effective disinformation is partly true. And 
there are all sorts of characters that get involved and it's hard to figure out who they are and what they're doing and tell the story in a way that you can follow. But the basic story is this, Creel sends a guy named Edgar Sisson, who was one of his top associates, who had been a muckraking editor and had never worked abroad to go to the Soviet Union, to go to Russia. And while he's there, he's given some, he's given some uh, articles, uh, some documents, which have since been completely discredited, almost entirely discredited. There are a few little tidbits in there that there, there were quite a large number of documents that might've been real, but uh, George Kennan famously discredited them and others have since, in which uh, claimed that the Germans were, I'm sorry, that the uh, Bolsheviks were German agents. And I don't need to explain this at great length to this group, I don't think, but of course, if they were German agents, that would explain why they took Russia out of the war. It would explain why Russia wasn't a didn't have a legitimate government. It would explain that uh, the Russian people really wanted to fight and they were like Americans and all the rest. Uh, and it also became an argument for, helped with the argument of why the United States could justify intervening and, send, and joining the other allies and sending troops into Russia because of course the Russian, the Bolshevik government wasn't a legitimate government. So you weren't really doing it. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but, yeah. but historians have, have, have elaborated on that particular point. Uh, so anyway, because Creel, uh, because Sisson doesn't know anything about any of this and he gets these documents and he's all excited like some investigative journalist and he comes back and he's told that he, that he has to just sit on these for a while. He's very upset. And I found all kinds of documents where he's going around Washington trying to get people to publish them. And finally, and we don't know how, I've spent a lot of time on this. We don't know exactly how it happened. But uh, on a particular Saturday, I think it's March, September 11th, we'll say, the State Department is informed the CPI has sent out a five, a six part series to editors around the country on the Sisson documents. Nobody had told the State Department about this at all. Uh, it's unclear what day that Wilson made this decision, but clearly he did it, you know, because of Creel. Um, and, um, and, and Wilson stood by these documents. We know that, there's no question about that. The State Department was caught completely flat-footed. It put his diplomats at risk in, in Europe, in, in Russia, because of course, these documents were, were not welcomed by the Bolsheviks. Uh, some of that story is known, but here's the part of the story that wasn't known. Only one newspaper that I can find, one, and a, and I, a graduate student and I went through all kinds of newspapers. First of all, almost all papers ran these stories. In fact, I, I'd be hard placed, and not weekly newspapers necessarily, but dailies. I don't think I, we found one that didn't run something, often just with the way the CPI provided it. Uh, and then editorial supporting it. Only one newspaper out of all those newspapers, the New York Evening Post, actually challenged the CPI on this. Uh, and the C and whenever and then and then the Nation, which was also owned by the owner of the uh, New York Evening Post, also raised some questions. And then the New Republic did some glancing questions, but not a big deal. Whenever this was done, Creel would have, or anybody said a peep, Creel would immediately start writing them letters and saying that you have no right to challenge these because they come out with the full authority of the government and Woodrow Wilson backs them 100%. That's almost a direct quote. And for you, to, for you not to publish these or for you to discredit these is an act of disloyalty. And this was always part of the CPI's way of operating. It, it, they, would, they would say, if you said something that didn't conform to what the administration wanted, it was called uh, enemy talk. That's the way we use fake news today. This is just enemy talk. So you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be saying these things because you're just saying what the enemy wants said. Uh, and so as a result, these were really rammed down the throat of the American public. And this, it's a longer story than we have time to go into because I'm sure we have other questions, but um, it figured into the political discourse uh, and it, it, it didn't help our relationships, relationship with the Russians. Uh, Sisson himself continued to make this case <laughs> all the way till he died in 1945 or 46 uh, to try to prove the documents were legitimate, but they weren't. Um, we have just a little over five minutes remaining. I wonder, I think you've, you know, both in your book and in your remarks, made a, an excellent case for the importance of thinking deeply about um, these issues and their deep origins. Um, that is the issue of propaganda and, and uh, government, particularly partisan administrations, getting into the business of um, manipulating information in order to achieve policy or other goals. We do have a question about 
um, how you see this book fitting into uh, a larger um, canvas of American history and particularly uh, um, historians and pundits kind of um, seemingly never ending concern with the rise of the United States as a as um, exceptionalist uh, and expansive global power. Do you see um, do you see uh, the story of the CPI as playing a role in the emergence of the United States um, as an expansive power? So, you know, that's a, that's a great question. And I don't have a great answer for it. Uh, <laughs> I, I can make a couple of glancing blows at it. Uh, I think in one sense, the idea that Wilson, first of all, Wilson's idea of what the world should have looked like was a was brilliant. His execution was flawed, but his idea was wonderful. At least that's how I see it. And I think the fact that, that, that we didn't get the treaty and we didn't participate was unfortunate because it took the United States out of, the, out of political discourse to a, an extent that shouldn't have happened. But ideas like public diplomacy, uh, those are really uh, important concepts and it's important for us to project high, high value, high democratic values abroad. I'm not one of those that believes that VOA should be used as a tool, uh, a propaganda tool in that quite in that sense. I, I believe it should be used as a way to demonstrate democratic values. And I, I, by the way, I'm just gonna make a small aside here because there are two heroes in this book and I, I won't have time to get into them. I wanna mention one and that's Arthur Bullard. A man who died very young was a fabulous, fabulous journalist, very thoughtful journalist in the same vein as somebody like uh, Lippmann um, and knew a lot about Russia. And he worked for the CPI and he wrote a series of letters to the Russians that stand in my mind as the best example of what public diplomacy should be like. And by the way, he also had other ideas like we should have people in other countries should go to the United States for university education. I mean, he was way ahead of his time. And so the CPI understood that and that's that, or at least some people in the CPI understood that and some people executed it as well as thought about it theoretically. So I think those, that's, that's part of it. Um, I think what, this is a whole another subject. We've gotten into a world where uh, information is starting to become uh, undermined and, and there's lots of this, everybody in this audience has thought about this as much as I have or more. But um, I think that's a problem for democracy. And, and I think one of the dangers, and that's a problem for us internationally as well, one of the dangers is the CPI, as I argued a moment ago, contributed to cynicism. The problem with propaganda is it makes people cynical. And although you introduce bigger doses of propaganda later on as you become more adept at using these techniques, the fact is that each time around the public becomes more and more inured to what the government says and more suspicious. And that's a problem. Well, Jack, thank you so much. Um, we might not agree on everything about Wilson, but um, we certainly agree that this story is vitally important, um, not only to historians and for a proper understanding of, of Wilson's period, uh, but um, I think you've made an excellent case that it's important for understanding our own moment. I really thank you for joining us and for writing the book. Um, once again, uh, it's John Maxwell Hamilton, Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda. You can get it at LSU Press. You can get it on Amazon. Um, please do so. <laughs> uh, it's well worth a read. Um, thank you everybody for joining us uh, for this first installment of Woodrow Wilson, Then and Now. I really appreciate your attention. I appreciate all the wonderful questions. I tried to get to as many as we could. Um, it was great to see the chat box filling up. Please go to the Wilson Center website, wilsoncenter.org. Uh, look for the History and Public Policy program, and you can find future events uh, in this vein and in related veins, uh, including our Washington History Seminar. Uh, and once again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank Jack once again. Uh, and I think we'll bring this first installment of Wilson Then and Now to a close. Thank you very much, Trig. Thanks, Jack.